America's the greatest country in the world. Welcome to our special America. I should say America's still the greatest country in the world, even though we're asking this question. Can Donald Trump be president from prison? Let that one sink in. What a time. That's where we are right now. The surrealness of this moment. They got what they wanted. Convicted felon Donald Trump. Whatever happened to the, the, the politically correct term, justice impacted persons. Justice impacted Donald J. Trump. Oh, what a time to be alive. And no crime, by the way, or no one knows what crime was committed that he's guilty of. It might go to prison for that reality beautifully personified by this woman right here. My fellow panelist here is celebrating that, that the rule of law has been vindicated and overturned 234 years of American legal tradition. I would challenge her to see if she could possibly articulate how and what crime Trump committed. Because so far, Alvin Bragg, the DA, has failed to do so. The, the judge in the case, Judge Marchand, has failed to do so. And they can't do it because Trump didn't commit any of the crimes for which he's been convicted. Well, let's just ask quickly before I go to Kevin. Francesca, just on that point, what crime did Trump commit? He, it was it was camp it was financial crimes it was white collar crimes it, it, it what that was that is exactly Which what one, they though? charged him it was he was convicted on what was the crime it's new york state law no, i understand they, what's the it, what was the crime it is new Francesca, I, gotta, I, actually, I don't even like not, it, it is well, literally hang on, hang on, he just got convicted on 34 counts Francesca, what of, was the of, crime of, of like cooking the actual books what was the crime you are not allowed so you are not allowed to to use your own financial, like your own money, to pay off somebody, and then he wrote, he he logged it as something different. He logged it as just a regular payment, but he was actually paying off this porn star to keep quiet, which, if he hadn't been running for president, would not have mattered, but he was, and so it impacted campaign finance laws in New York State. Okay, that is what Juan Merchan just oversaw this. Okay. Alvin Bragg okay. brought these charges that's, because that's Michael not, Cohen that's not quite was happened. already okay. sentenced okay. to three years okay. to do it. Okay, let's just go before... Kevin, I'd be very, very, very patient. But I will I'm come no, to you. Look, I'm no expert. Let me just say, hang on, no, no, Michael. You are Michael, no expert, by that's the way. Because the campaign finance law is a federal wait. law. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Listen, in her defense, I feel a bit bad for her because no one knows what law was... My favorite line in her just drowning, grasping for anything was, this was oversaw by Judge Marchand. Like, you mean the guy who gave money to Joe Biden's campaign, which is against the law? My buddy sent me this text the other day. He said, uh, said, Slater, I agree that this has never happened. All this stuff with Trump, Trump in prison possibly, right? Convicted felon, uh, president uh, convicted. I agree this has never happened before. But also... Has a president ever done something so egregious as to misclassify a payment? Whew. That's, that's a good point. I don't know if anyone, any president's ever done something that bad before. So can President can, can Trump be president from prison? Well, first, he has to be sent to prison, sentencing July 11th, four days before the Republican convention. Hmm. I think he will be sent to prison. On the surface, and we'll talk to Josh Hamm and some others about maybe some other uh, implications that need to be considered. But on the surface, I have three reasons why at least they desperately want to send him to prison. First, you have to understand the depths of their Trump derangement syndrome. Trump derangement syndrome is real. It's a very serious disease. It will make you foam at the mouth with a rabid, intense hatred, a seething, red-hot hatred of not only the man, but everyone associated with him. You see red Every MAGA hats everywhere if you have Trump derangement syndrome. On uh, my radio show, Breitbart News Daily, which we simulcast here on the first TV every morning, six to, uh, 7 to 9 Eastern, um, on Memorial Day, we shared the story of Louis Zamperini. Very, very short of it. Uh, prisoner of war in the Pacific during World War II. Maybe you saw the movie Unbroken. Uh, and you saw how much he was tortured by this guy called The Bird. But what you didn't see in the Angelina Jolie movie, because they stop halfway through the book, was after he got out and came home and he had what we now call um, PTSD, but he would have these nightmares at the bird every single night, and it ruined his life. And, and we don't have time to go into all the details, but you just met every single night, he had visions of getting beaten to death by this, this Japanese guy, the bird. And then he went to a um, revival uh, and by Billy Graham, and uh, yada, 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 he was ultimately saved, and he forgave the bird. And that night, dreams went away, the nightmares went away. 
The Democrats will never forgive Trump. They'll never forgive him for beating Hillary, for ending the Obama era, for, for ending hope and change. Forgive him? Move on? No, never. <laughs> never, you can't, not when you have full-blown TDS. That's the first reason. Second reason I, I think they'll send him to prison. Uh, when Marshawn does it, it's all up to him. Marshawn will have, the judge, he will have a first-class ticket to the favor of the elites for the rest of his life. And people so desperately want to be a part of this. People love praise. They love praise from their, from their tribe. And oh, Marshawn will, will get, a, get more praise than you can imagine. This is, this is a clip of church on the Sunday after the conviction of Donald Trump. This is Alvin Bragg going to church. Now I just have two words to say now, sisters and brothers. Two words to say, that's it. Are you ready for those words? Alvin Bragg. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Let's give it up for our brother. <laughs> All right, we can stop there. So listen, that, that clip, that moment. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt the organ. That's weird for religious reasons that maybe we could talk about another day. But that's just an example of the praise that Alvin Bragg gets every time he walks into a room with the progressive elite. Oh, that is a gentleman. And the organ, maybe an organ follows him. Maybe the, the organist travels with the organ to every, every room he walks into, it gets that. Same thing with Judge Marchand. That's a powerful incentive. Don't underestimate the amount of praise and adjuration that these people will get for putting Trump behind bars. Here's the guy, ladies and gentlemen, Juan Marchand, the man who put Donald Trump behind prison, the man who killed Hitler. Can you be a judge who donates to a group called Stop Republicans and then is in a position to literally stop the Republican and not take it? There's a similar pressure that the jurors were under as well, right? Imagine if there's a juror who maybe even wanted to be fair but knew that their family and friends had Trump derangement syndrome and knew that if they, if they didn't find him guilty, they'd go home. And, and my mom would ask me, what did you do? You did the right, you said he's guilty, right? No, I couldn't, mom, I didn't do it because here's all the evidence. Oh, I thought I knew my daughter. I thought I knew you. I thought you were better than this. I thought I raised you better than this. How could you not have put that monster behind prison? It's a powerful force. And the opposite of that is I want this praise. I want this love. I want, I want it lavished on me for the rest of my life. And if I just put him in prison, then I'll have it forever. Third reason I think they'll put him in jail is this hasn't worked yet. They still can't stop him. They haven't stopped him. They keep trying to break the man. Mentally, emotionally, physically, financially. They can't break him. And his support stays the same or goes up. Maybe one day they'll realize that pardoning Trump will probably help them, the Democrats. I don't know. I think the hatred's too deep. That's why I think they'll put him in jail. Now, I think this will all lead to their destruction, the Democrats, if not America's, but certainly the Democrats. It'll be a Fyrick victory, a Fyrick victory named after King Fyrus in Greece. He was attacking the Romans, it was 280 BC. And uh, Plutarch tells a story of, of a battle that Fyrus won, but he lost so many men and, and so many elephants in the battle. Uh, the famous line is, uh, if, 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 we have another, if we have another such victory, uh, it will utterly undo us or undo me. Like if, if we win like that again, we're done. So sure, Dems, maybe you won the battle, but at what cost? You want to put him in jail? Great, go for it. But at what cost? Talk about this with our experts. Can Donald Trump be president from prison? Will he be sent from prison? And then what are we to do? Now that we got a George Soros DA that did his job, we got some other conservative DAs across the country, they can do their job? Can Donald Trump be president from prison? Man, what a time to be alive. Mike Slater, the first TV. Spread the word. A judge could decide to say, hey, house arrest or even jail. It could. How do you face it could. what that could look like? I'm okay with it. I saw... 
One of my lawyers the other day on television saying, oh, no, you don't want to do that to the press. I said, don't, you don't beg for anything. You just, the way it is. So, that could happen. I don't know that the public would stand it, you know. I don't, I'm not sure the public would stand for it. Uh, with a uh, tried house arrest or, or I think I think it would be tough for the public to take. You know, at a certain point, there's a breaking point. I love that clip. Don't beg. Don't beg. Josh Hammers here, host of America on Trial. Watch that. Listen to that podcast. Podcast uh, about all these trials. And Josh, I remember we've been doing this for a while now, since all these four different court cases have been going on, and here we are, one of them now in the books. Pretty unbelievable. Um, so I got to ask you the question of the special. Can Donald Trump be president in jail? So let's first discuss whether or not he is actually going to jail, I guess. Then we can get to that second question. So the sentencing is coming up on, on July 11th. Look, personally, Mike, I think that they are going to do everything they possibly can to justify putting him in jail. Why? Because they have already crossed like five to 25, maybe even like a thousand Rubicons at this point. You know, people are like, oh, we've crossed the Rubicon. We're at a point of no return. I mean, from my perspective, you know, we crossed the Rubicon when the Obama administration started suing nuns, the, like the little sisters of the poor, just to subsidize abortifacients. We crossed the Rubicon back during the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation hearing in 2018. We crossed the Rubicon back when the billions of dollars in damage from the Antifa Black Lives Matter rise in 2020 essentially were, you, you know, no one has seemed to care about that from COVID-19, no accountability. For, we, we, we have crossed so many Rubicons in this country. And when it comes to Trump in particular, I have no doubt that they are going to try to put him in jail. Here is the one reason why maybe, maybe they actually can't do it. it they logistically might actually not be able to. And it's terrible. It, it is horrifying that we were even having this conversation. But logistically, the way this works is you would have to send him to Rikers Island or to some other New York City prison. The problem is that in New York City in the prison system, including Rikers, which presumably they try to send him to because it's the most infamous of all the bunch, you can't actually get guns or arms anywhere near the prisoners. They have very well-established protocols. There are actual hard, hard, hard barriers and whatnot there. But it is federal mandate, it is federal law that the president must have armed secret, secret service near him in perpetuity for the rest of his life. So, you know, it's, it's a basic constitutional principle under the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution that federal law trumps state law when there's any kind of conflict there. And so they actually might not be able to do it. But when there's a will, there's a way, Mike. I don't underestimate these demons and savages that we're dealing with either. Gosh, that's such an unbelievable con Like, I'm just, <laughs> so taken back by this entire special that we're having right now. The logistics of how the Secret Service would defend Trump in Rikers Island. Like, would you, like, deputize a Secret Service agent as a prison guard so then they would be able to protect him while in prison? Like, you build a different wing off the prison <laughs> just for president? Like, what? I, like you said, the will is a way. I don't think that would hold them back. What could, what would... Like, what moral thing would hold them back at this point? You know what I mean? Like, like at what point would they be like, all right, all right, yeah. we've done enough here. Let's not put the man actually in jail. So let's, let's play this out a little bit more. I mean, let's say that they somehow are able to reconcile this puzzle that I presented here and square this circle, and they somehow find <laughs> a way to, to actually get the Secret Service inside Rikers Island in you know, solitary confinement or something outrageous like that. Okay, I, I, I actually increasingly don't think that's, that, that's going to happen, but let, let, let's stipulate just for sake of argument that it does. If Donald Trump then literally wins a presidential election from, from a prison cell in, in November 2024, call me naive, I have to assume, I have to assume that Kathy Hochul, the governor of New York, would probably issue a pardon at that point. Because at that point, you're literally looking at the president-elect, soon to be president of the United States come January 2025, being in a literal prison cell. Now, there's nothing in the U.S. Constitution that precludes this. There, there is no express stipulation in the, in federal constitutional or statutory law that says that a, a president of the United States cannot preside over the country from prison. You know, the reason why that's not there in the law is because who in the world would have ever thought that this was a possibility? I mean, like the, the founding fathers were talking about like political philosophy and, and all these grand stuff. <laughs> they didn't have time to talk about the possibility that someone could govern the country from jail. So it's, it's, it's not in there. So in, in theory, it kind of sort of could happen. You know, so Trump could in theory have his Nelson Mandela moment, so to speak, where he actually wins an election from jail. I, again, I call me naive and uh, I, it would be the first time someone's called me that. I have to believe that the pressure brought on Kathy Hochul at that point to issue a pardon 
would would be astronomical. I think that you would have any literally everybody, but the hardest of the hard, hard, hard left of the Democratic Party who would be saying, okay, at this point, like we need a functional president. This country has an economy. We have a border. We have foreign relations. We need someone, whatever you might think of him, who can literally just sit there and do the duties of a president. So at that point, that's probably the way it would work. But there is nothing necessarily forcing Kathy Hochul either to make that decision. And that, but this all assumes that they would let him win <laughs> at all in right. the first place, too. Like, let's say he gets sentenced to, to Rikers or whatever. That's right before the RNC. So they could keep him from the RNC, right? Maybe they do like some symbolic, you're in jail for a week kind of thing. Um, who would run the campaign, right? Do you have the vice president at that point? It would be the, the face. And would they, do you think this would help Trump? Right, so I didn't touch on this, so thanks for that. But like, if there is a, let, let's say it is a jail sentence, or even if, it's, even if it's house arrest, probation, whatever the sentence actually is, the the appeals court could immediately stay that. You know, Trump's lawyers will obviously immediately appeal that. The appellate court could stay that pending appeal, and they could do that within minutes, within hours. I, I think that probably will happen at this point. I mean, I mean, this case, mm -hmm. as we've covered on, on America on Trial, as we covered here on the first time and time again, this case was so unbelievably riddled with clear, reversible error, whether it comes to the 14th Amendment due process clause or various Sixth Amendment rights. The fact that the judge obviously should have been recused. Trump couldn't call their lead expert witness, Brad Smith, the former FEC commissioner. I could go on and on. This this case was uniquely, uniquely and historically flawed for countless reasons. So at a bare minimum, I will be optimistic that the New York Court of Appeals, which is the highest court in the land in New York, it's in Albany, the state capital. I have to think that they would probably stay an actual prison sentence if, God forbid, that is the decision that comes down on July 11th. So that would allow Trump to go to the convention. It would allow him to campaign out in the, out in the Midwest states and so forth there. Heaven forbid, it, again, it, let's just cut, do the whole sake of argument thing. If they do the prison sentence and the New York Court of Appeals does not stay, then yeah, I guess he's I guess he's in prison. He wouldn't be able to formally accept the, the Republican Party's presidential nomination at the convention in Milwaukee in wow. July. And at that point, you know, you'd have moderate independent voters, Mike, who I think are looking at this and being like, what the actual hell is happening right now? <laughs> what was there any reason to believe why the New York Court of Appeals is some, um, you know, vaulted noble arbiters of truth and wisdom and justice? So, so two things here. One is. So, so the New York State Judiciary is very complicated. So, so you have the New York trial courts, Juan Marchand is a trial court. Confusingly, they call that the Supreme Court. New York's the only state in the country where the word Supreme Court does not actually refer to the highest court in the land, it refers to the trial courts. Then the intermediate court is the appellate division of the New York Supreme Court. Both the trial court judges and the appellate division of the Supreme Court are elected. They serve 14 year terms. So that is why I'm not particularly optimistic that the appellate division would do anything because if you're actually running for election in Manhattan, which is a very far left jurisdiction, obviously, you do not want to run for re for reelection on the platform that you stayed at Donald Trump's sentencing, his prison mandate. But I think if Trump's lawyers can expedite an appeal to the court in Albany, the, the New York Court of Appeals, which is the highest court in New York, it will be on much firmer ground for the very simple reason that one, that is not an elected court. Those ju those justices are, are are nominating and consent, very similar to how we do it at a federal level. And two, you know, kind of the broader thing here is, you know, New York State has a reputation in theory to preserve, in theory, because I grew up there and it's gone very far downhill ever since then. New York State and New York City was the commercial and financial and in many ways the cultural cultural capital of the Western world for a very, very long time. So at a certain fundamental level, in addition to the justices not serving actual terms there, they're a little more insulated from the political process, they surely have at least some consideration to bear in mind when it comes to preserving whatever little integrity of the New York judicial system might actually remain. Great point. About uh, 30 seconds left. Uh, what about the Supreme Court jumping in early on this and just putting the kibosh on it before it goes through all that other stuff? So, you know, I raised this possibility actually recently to a, to a group chat of a bunch of fellow right wing lawyers. And one of my friends who, who I won't name, obviously, but he's a former U.S. Supreme Court clerk himself. He said it's a very bad idea for the very simple reason that you would actually be 
jumping over possible levels of relief in the interim, and you'd be, you'd be putting all of your eggs in the basket of the U.S. Supreme Court. You know, I don't know about you, Mike, but I, I, I don't particularly want to trust John Roberts, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett to necessarily do the right thing. They don't always do the right thing here. And if you jump over the New York Court of Appeals and go straight to the U.S. Supreme Court, you're not going to be able to go back easily to the New York Court of Appeals. So, so, so you, it's a very, very risky uh, proposition. I'm not confident in it. Oh, very interesting. Josh Hammer, America on trial if you want all this and more with the three other trials that Trump is still facing right now as well. Josh, great to talk to you, brother. You bet, anytime. So there's the background. Now, what do we do next? Particularly, what do we do with these DAs that aren't stopping, right? We have these, these uh, George Soros DAs that now they have a playbook on how they can take down Trump and others. And then what do we do? What do conservative DAs, conservatives do now moving forward? Now that Rubicon has been crossed, that's next right here on The First TV. Hey, welcome back to our special. I want to go right to our next guest, Cully Stimson, senior legal fellow at the Wonderful Heritage Foundation. He's also the author of the book, Rogue Prosecutors, How Radical Soros Lawyers Are Destroying America's Communities Indeed. Mr. Simpson, how are you, sir? I'm great. Thanks for having me back. The, the question of the day, do you think that Judge Marshawn will send Donald J. Trump to prison? You know, it's it's an amazing question to even pose to a person in America in 2024. Uh, sadly, I think there's an outside chance he will do that. Um, and I mean, he shouldn't have sat on the case in the first place for reasons we can talk about. But <clears throat> I think that uh, this guy has proven himself to be a person that does not have the judicial demeanor or judgment uh, to sit on this case. And so can I envision him trying to sentence the president to jail? Yeah, I can. Amazing. Let's, uh, maybe we can swing back around to Judge Marchand, but let's go to Alvin Bragg. What do we need to know about this DA? So <clears throat> on one level, Alvin Bragg did have a good background and experience to be an elected DA. He was a federal prosecutor. He has a good education. He worked as a prosecutor. And typically when you're a prosecutor, and I've been one, uh, and I've been a defense attorney and a judge, you want to prosecute cases. And so the problem begins that when he ran for DA, he ran partly on a platform to go after and indict former President Trump. He didn't indicate what crimes he committed. Uh, he essentially suggested he'd find the crime uh, later on if they elected him. Uh, and so that's why we dedicated a whole chapter in our book to Alvin Bragg, because he should have been a prosecutor's prosecutor, and he's anything but, uh, given the policies he issued when he first took office and what he's done uh, and crossed a Rubicon that no other county DA has done in the history of our country. Have you ever seen a DA ever run on vote for me and I will find a crime for this person? No. I've seen DAs, and there's 2,300 elected DAs across the country, so I'm not familiar with the campaign platforms for all of them say, you know, I'm going to crack down on violent crime or I'm going to focus on this type of crime. Uh, but I've never seen them single out a person and say, I'm going to go after Bobby or Susie here uh, if you elect me, because that's purely inappropriate. That's probably violative of state bar ethics rules. Uh, but of course, the New York State Bar is going to give this guy cover six ways to Sunday. At least I'd give Alvin Bragg a little credit if he said, I'm, I'm going to go after business ledger uh, business, you know, business classification bookkeeping errors across New York City, <laughs> and then at least uh, you have some credibility there. Um, what do you think drives, and maybe we can back up to George Soros too, uh, or you can stay on Alvin Bragg specifically, but what do you think drives him? Like, why, what is this, this desire? I must, I must get him no matter what. You know, Alvin Bragg's not unique. There are people who just loathe Trump as people on the left, uh, and they will use whatever means they can, legal or illegal, or questionable legal theories to do that and use the law and twist the law in a way to try to hold uh, former President Trump accountable for alleged crimes. I mean, to think that he's charged him essentially with misdemeanor business falsification records whose statute limitations have run but to elevate that to a felony to prove another crime, but then refuse 
to indicate to the defense what that other crime was and then have a judge play along with that even when the defense files a motion for a bill of particulars basically saying by the way what are we supposed to defend against and the judge didn't allow them to do that so there are major dear due process uh considerations here that were potentially violated the appeals court will have that and 10 or 12 other issues that the defense will file on appeal but the damage has been done We've now crossed a Rubicon that has never been crossed before, and that is a local county elected DA has gone after a federal, a former president. And I think you're unfortunately uh, may see other DAs now uh, wading into that uh, sorted pool. Yes, I want to talk about that. Is there an argument to be made? that now we need some conservative DAs. I know when I used to live in San Diego, there's a good conservative DA out there. She's not an activist by any means, but okay, right? She's one of the few maybe conservative, whatever. There's some conservative DA out there. Can he go after or she go after Fauci for uh, uh, going around FOIA requests? Let's get him. That's a crime. You can't uh, get out around Freedom of Information Act requests. Can we prosecute him? The, pro the process is the punishment, right? Right, and you're referring to Summer Stefan, who's a personal friend and great district attorney in San Diego, oh, nice. where my wife worked as a DA. She's a prosecutor's prosecutor, incredibly fair. She would never weaponize the law for political gain. She never has and she never will. But there are other people, potentially, who might feel the need or desire or the green light to do just that uh, as a way of retribution or political get back uh, at a former Democratic president. I hope that doesn't happen. Uh, but now we've seen Fannie Willis in Atlanta uh, go after the president for exercising what I think are his First Amendment rights to contest an election that he thought was unfair to him. And we've seen Alvin Bragg's charade uh, in New York. So what's to stop one of the 2,300 other elected DAs? For example, what about a DA in one of the many counties in Texas uh, prosecuting former President sure. Biden whenever he leaves office for saying your border policy has caused death and destruction in our county and we've lost people to murder uh, by illegal aliens. You should have known about it. It was reckless for you to do that. You were warned about it. You didn't do it. So we're charging you with manslaughter. What's to charge? What's to stop any of them from coming up with some cockamamie uh, theory and getting it past a grand jury and a judge? Nothing. So some will say we need to do that because that will right the wrongs and we can all like call truce and be like, oh, enough of that. But that could very easily spiral out of control. What does America look like if that's the road we go down and it's just game on? It looks like the way Rome ended. Uh, Rome ended uh, in essence because they weaponized the law against each other uh, and it resulted in the end of a great Republican country. And so uh, I hope mm -hmm. that people exercise their better angels and judgment and simply say, look, we're better than that, and we're not going to do what they did. Uh, and I hope the appeals courts takes very seriously uh, the many grounds of appeal, not, in, not only including the change of venue, the lack of the judge recusing himself from the case, even though he donated to the Biden-Harris campaign, his daughter works for Biden, uh, not allowing the defense to have knowledge of what the charge was, the other crime was, until the end of the trial, and on and on and on. And so I think Democrats and Republicans are good DAs around the country and people should stand down and not think about retribution uh, and let these cases fall on their face and use that as the example of why not to do it. Hmm. Carly Stimson, Senior Legal Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Mr. Simpson, thank you for your time, sir. Thanks for having me. Talk with Mike Davis, founder of the Article Three Project, next right here on The First TV. You famously said regarding Hillary Clinton, lock her up. You declined to do that as president. I beat her. It's easier when you win. And they all said lock her up. And I felt, and I could have done it, but I felt it would have been a terrible thing. And then this happened to me. And so I may feel differently about it. I can't tell you. I can, I'm not sure I can answer the question. Hillary Clinton, I didn't say lock her up, but the people would all say lock her up, lock her up. Okay. Then we won. And I say, and I said pretty openly, I say, all right, come on, just relax. Let's go. We're going to make our country great. Yeah. 
And it would have been, think of it, you lock up the wife of a president of the United States. But they States. want to lock you up over $130,000 of an accounting thing. A and she perfectly, actually... And a perfectly stated accounting thing. But, you know, people also say, can you bring the country together? And the answer is yes. Success will bring the country together because I had it together. Mm, that was the high road. It was back in 2016 he was referring to. Of course, there was a political article quoting him saying that he didn't want to drag the Clintons through this. He didn't want to... Uh, drag the country through this, let's just move on together. And that was the end of it, but indeed it was not. Mike Davis is here, founder of the Article 3 Project. Maybe, I'm just throwing it out there, maybe Trump's next attorney general. I don't know. I'm not going to put that on you, Mike, but I'll throw it out there. How you doing, sir? I'm doing well, and I always say I can't get confirmed as the attorney general. I'm, I'm just too charming, but I think I want to be Trump's viceroy because then <laughs> I don't have to be accountable to courts in Congress. That's right. The cross you bear. I'm too charming of a man. Uh, sir, we, uh, we just talked to our previous guest, and we're talking about what, what if uh, a conservative DA somewhere across the country maybe threw some charges against Tony Fauci, right? There's evidence that Fauci went around some Freedom of Information Act requests. That's a crime. Maybe we go, uh, we, we try to throw him in jail. And, you know, the, the punishment is the process. The process is the punishment. What the heck? Might as well go for it. And he said that would be a terrible idea. It's what ended Rome, the Roman Republic, and uh, we should never go down that road. What do you think about that? Look, I, I like Coley Stenson from the Heritage Foundation. He's a very good guy. Uh, I think that he's uh, being a little bit too quaint here. The Democrats, the Biden Democrats, have already crossed the Rubicon with their Republic ending uh, Democrats, lawfare and election interference. They've gone after Trump. They've gone after his top aides like Peter Navarro, who's sitting in prison right now, and Steve Bannon, who they want to put in prison. They've gone after his lawyers like Jeff Clark uh, and John Eastman. They're going at, they've gone after his January 6th supporters. They've even gone after parents outraged by gender chaos in schools and the resulting rapes in high school bathrooms. They've gone after Christians praying outside of abortion clinics. They put them in prison for doing that. Little old Christians under the FACE Act, while they've given amnesty to Joe Biden and James Biden and Hunter Biden, every scumbag Biden who has taken at least $20 million, according to House Oversight Chairman James Comer, from it seems like every corrupt foreign entity has gone in to the Biden bank accounts. They give amnesty to BLM and Antifa and Hamas and trans terrorist and abortion industry activists. No, no, no. The only way this ends and Republicans need to wake up to this, they, they want to say, oh, we're better than this. How this ends is to give the Democrats a healthy dose of their own medicine. Today's Democrats aren't liberals who love America and just disagree with the conservatives in the best way to get there. They're leftists and they only respect power. So we need to give them power. I'll throw in there all the prosecutions against the, the fake electors uh, across the country, which are just the backup electors, but they're going after hard after all of them in many different states. Um, okay, what does that look like, Mr. Davis? Give, give me some examples of, of, of what that looks like and, and back at them. Well, I mean, I, maybe I've thought about this a bit, but I would say that right now the House Republicans need to find their backbones and they need to start opening investigations immediately and they need to issue subpoenas for documents for staff depositions and for witnesses for public hearings and gather the evidence now like the january 6th kangaroo commission did against trump and his top aides and his supporters gather gather that evidence now you do have a legislative purpose that biden democrats are using federal funds to wage this criminal conspiracy against trump his top aides his supporters you also, they've also deprived uh, the, Trump and his allies of their constitutional rights to due process and equal protection. At the federal level, you have the Fifth Amendment. So there's the legislative purpose there for, for House Republicans. At the state level, you have the 14th Amendment for equal protection and due process. And Section 5 of the 14th Amendment specifically gives Congress the power to enact legislation. So there's your legislative purpose. You can also open an impeachment probe and gather even more evidence and get around executive privilege or whatever privileges that the Biden White House and the Biden Justice Department want to put up. And then state attorneys general and local DAs like the Florida Attorney General Moody and the, the Georgia Attorney General Carr and Rachel Mitchell, my former colleague out in Maricopa County, Arizona. This criminal conspiracy against Trump and his top aides and supporters 
is at many different levels. Jack Smith, uh, Fannie Willis, Alvin Bragg, Tish James, Nathan Wade. I mean, there are a lot of, uh, at, at a minimum, fact witnesses of this criminal conspiracy to violate constitutional rights for the purposes of interfering in the election and to wage Democrat lawfare to destroy your political enemies, this selective prosecution, persecution. There are many, many different hooks. And then when the Trump 47 Justice Department gets into office on the first day on January 20th, 2025, Trump's acting attorney general must open a criminal probe immediately on this criminal conspiracy to violate constitutional rights. And that's under 18 U.S.C., Section 241 and 18 U.S.C. Section 242. So there's there's your game plan. It's not that hard. You wow. start issuing subpoenas now. Well, I thought I didn't know where you. I didn't know you were going to go specifically to Joe Biden and specifically for this. I love it. What crime did someone commit here? Obviously, all this stuff is wrong. But what crime do you think Joe Biden or these people at the top committed? Well, there are many, but I can think of two that I just mentioned. There are there are federal civil rights felony statutes that are on the books right now, 18 U.S.C. 241 and 18 U.S.C. 242. And when you politicize and weaponize our intel agencies and our justice system to go after your political enemies, when you put illegal unconstitutional gag orders on criminal defendants, when you don't provide fair notice of what the charges are, if you don't provide equal protection and due process of the law, if you don't require unanimous jury verdicts, like what just happened in New York, where this corrupt Democrat Juan Marchand, who donated to Biden illegally under New York law, and whose adult daughter Lauren Marchand is raising millions of dollars off of her father's unprecedented criminal trial of a former and likely future president, requiring his recusal under New York statute. When you, when you violate constitutional rights as a government official, if you violate constitutional rights as a private citizen colluding with government officials, you face very serious felony liability under 18 U.S.C. 241 and 242, conspiracy against rights and uh, uh, violating civil rights under the color of law. And those are up to 10 years in prison. They're no joke. And the Trump 47 Justice Department must open criminal probes on this on day one. I hate it. I hate it if there was some bookkeeping error somewhere in the White House. What um, what standing does Arizona have? How could the Attorney General or, or DA or whoever of of Florida push these charges forward? Well, you you remember you have the this criminal conspiracy, the overt acts of this criminal conspiracy by President Biden himself. His fingerprints are on all four of these criminal prosecutions, with Matthew Colangelo going from the number three office in the Biden. Justice Department, a senior political appointee to Bragg's office in New York City. You had uh, you had Jonathan Sue, President Biden's deputy White House counsel, colluding with General Counsel Jerry Gary Stern of the National Archives and Jay Brad at the Justice Department to do the bogus Mar-a-Lago raid for presidential records. Trump was allowed to have under the Presidential Records Act. That was in Florida. So you have Moody's office the, the, as the AG. Uh, you have uh, you have Chris Carr uh, in Georgia because of the Fulton County DA, Fannie Willis, who hired her dumb, unqualified boyfriend, Nathan Wade, and he was dumb enough to bill his time to Fulton County taxpayers. They got COVID funds to do this, federal COVID funds. Uh, uh, Nathan billed his time to meet with the Biden White House, including the Biden White House counsel, 16 hours, $250 an hour. He was dumb enough to put this on paper. Uh, so that was obviously about the Trump case. Otherwise, he couldn't have billed his time uh, for those 16 hours with the Biden White House. He couldn't bill his time to go to the White House Easter egg roll. So, uh, you know, it's there's clear evidence that Biden was is directly involved with all four of these unprecedented Republic ending criminal indictments of Trump. This is a criminal conspiracy by Biden, Jonathan Sue, Merritt Garland, Lisa Monaco, the deputy attorney general, uh, Jack Smith. Jay Bratt, Gary Stern, Judge Juan Mershon, Lauren Mershon, Tanya Shutkin in D.C. who put an illegal gag order on Trump. There are so many de Biden Democrat prosecutors, judges, witnesses, and operatives who are part of this criminal conspiracy. At a minimum, they are fact witnesses, and they should be subpoenaed so we can gather facts 
when Trump 47 Justice mm. Department's up and running, but many of them are co-conspirators. Mike Davis, naming names. Uh, my last question for you. I, I got very frustrated at the most recent Fauci hearings, but it's been like this for a while. Where they, they grill them, like, oh, what a grilling. And then they, he just walks up and then they go in. That's it, like, yeah, nothing ever happens to them. Um, there's enough plausible deniability and these guys just walk away. Can't, they, can't the Biden White House do the same thing here? Like, ah, oh, Merrick Garland the other day was asked about Colangelo. He's like, ah, oh, I don't know. He just he decided to move to New York. What do you want me to do? Right? How can you, how can you then elevate this from these very frustrating hearings which go nowhere to an actual trial. They got Trump in the courtroom. They may get, they may put him in a jail. They were able to take it to the next level more so than just a hearing. How do we do that? Yeah, you have to issue subpoenas. You have to get their documents. You have to have staff depositions. You have to have public hearings. You need to have people who actually know what the hell they're doing when they're having these public hearings instead of these, the amateur hours. Uh, the amateur hours at these yeah. public hearings with these House Republicans who don't know how to ask the right questions. We need to have civil lawsuits. We need to have criminal enforcement right now by these DAs and these AGs all across the country who were affected by COVID. Remember this, Tony Fauci funded the birth of COVID in the Wuhan lab. Illegally, he funded gain-of-function research. He lied about it to Congress. Uh, he covered it up. He engaged in a criminal conspiracy to cover it up. Millions of people have died across the world, uh, just about the entire world. Billions of people had their lives uh, seriously altered for years, and we lost trillions of dollars in treasure. And that's because of Tony Fauci, this mad scientist who funded this very dangerous illegal gain-of-function research in China. Let's go. Let's get after some of these guys. Let's take it up a notch. Mike Davis, founder of the Article 3 Project. Remember the name, maybe Trump's next attorney general. I'd love to see this more so than just on the TV. Let's get this in action. Mike, great to talk to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So it's up to you now. Both of our last guests said we've crossed the Rubicon, but the previous guest said uh, we've crossed it, but let's not, but let's go back. But that's the point of crossing the Rubicon is you can't go back. That's, the, that's what that means, crossing the Rubicon. You can't go back. Once it's done, it's done. The cast is die, as Julius Caesar said when he crossed it. The, the die is cast. This is it. It's game on. What are we going to do? Just keep taking it? We're going to keep taking it? Or we're going to do what Mike, Sab Mike Davis said there. Let's start going on some offense, as if you need another reason to vote for Donald Trump. Mike Slater, The First TV. Spread the word.